Uh, yeah. yeah, I think we should probably start now. Uh, I'm Vladimir, and I'm really, really flattered that you decided to skip uh, like the gods of GIS, Paul and Frank, to come to my talk. That's really, really surprising. Uh, maybe some of you thought, whoa, that's the guy who puts funny pictures on slides. <laughs> and yeah, I am. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a guy living in Ukraine, and I'm a rock musician. Um, and uh, I also happen to write some code, too. Uh, I work at Mapbox, and I also created a thing called Leaflet, which is everywhere now, so probably most of you know what it is. So just a short recap of what I talked about uh, on my last talks. Phosphor G. Uh, Leaflet is by far the most used open source mapping library ever. And uh, it's used everywhere by like, the biggest websites of the world. And you can, you can see it on, like, on websites you use every day. Um, yeah, so it's really, really everywhere now. And in very surprising places. But in, like, in 2008, it wasn't the case. And web mapping landscape was pretty, pretty difficult. <laughs> Uh, that's, yeah, that was my experience back in the day. So, uh, Leaflet was born against a lot. Uh, and uh, when I decided to create a really lightweight and very easy to use mapping library, everyone said that, like, I can't do it, uh, that I'm wasting time, and that I should uh, use established major open source solution that existing, exists today, but I decided to still go on with my library, and it's like challenge accepted. And uh, Leaflet was born again as a protest against bloat, clutter, and complexity. And uh, its uh, top priorities were always simplicity and performance. Uh, and yeah, I always try to make conscious effort to simplify uh, the code, simplify features, uh, not uh, accept uh, too many features, and basically try to make it uh, down to the bare essentials and leave all the rest to plugin developers. So um, about a year ago, uh, I released uh, the latest stable now, 0.7.3 version. Oh, no, 0.7. Uh, so, and I decided, I started working on next features uh, for Leaflet, and uh, like the version that was coming up with was 0.8, but I decided that uh, this Leaflet, this next re Leaflet release is shaping up to be so good that I'm going to call it 1.0. Uh, uh, yeah, so I decided to, to create 1.0 version. But uh, like, uh, if you call a version like this after many, many years of development, you start to think, oh, maybe I should work on it harder and put more features in it. And so I, I set out to create like the best version of Leaflet ever, like implement uh, features that people were asking for for a long, long time, fix the, the most common issues, and rewrite all the code that I thought was not up to my standards. So yeah, and I started working on Leaflet 1.0. And to like, briefly describe my experience, of working on it and like, the past year, uh, here is a GIF. <laughs> so it turned out to be much, much harder than I expected. So we can look at the history of uh, Leaflet development. It's a graph from GitHub, uh, uh, number of commits per day. So we can see that Leaflet started somewhere in the end of 2010. Yeah, pretty long time ago. 
And uh, let's look at the last year. So there was a 0 0.7 release. And then I set out to create the best leaflet version ever. And I have lots and lots of enthusiasm and start coding lots and lots of awesome stuff. And you can see the huge spike here. And I'm like, wow, awesome. And then, like, <laughs> what happened? And I'll try to describe like what happened. Because like, a lot of people were complaining, that, like, is Leaflet dead? Is, is it abandoned? It's not developed very actively now. And like, it has been a year since the last major version. Uh, so yeah, let me recap. <laughs> uh, so here's an example of uh, a trap I got into, like episode one of many. Uh, so there was a really awesome feature uh, that was present in some other libraries, like uh, uh, Modest Maps. And there was a library for it called Easy uh, by Mapbox that did like, really nifty animations like this. Like, where it's doing animations from one place to another uh, in a really, really nice curve, like simultaneously doing zooming and panning. Uh, and I set out to implement this feature. And uh, this is actually working in Leaflet, so it's, it's done now, and you'll be able to use it. So um, arbitrary animation curve, uh, uh, it required me to implement fractional zoom because like, to, to program animation like this, you have to calculate uh, each frame like where the map should be. Uh, so that required a really, really drastic change of paradigm of uh, how Leafwood was written. So, this is called fractional zoom, where you can, can set the view to any zoom level with like floating point values. Uh, and uh, Leaflet was developed from the beginning, like for many, many years, assuming that I would never have to deal with fractional zoom, right? because it's simple, it's lightweight, and like, I'm going to ignore every request to, to make fractional zoom level because I thought that it, it uh, wasn't like worth it. Um, and also, arbitrary animation curve required uh, a very different approach to tile layer animations. So I had to eventually rewrite it from scratch too and spend lots and lots of days on it, and not only me, but other contri contributors. So it's very hard to describe like what's it about, but basically, uh, tower animations got much, much nicer in Leaflet. So it starts animation uh, um, during the zoom level, not after. Uh, and uh, like previously, Leaflet, uh, when you zoomed into another zoom, uh, it kept a background tile layer so that while the new tiles are loading, you would uh, not see everything like flicker. So that would be a seamless experience. But Leaflet always kept only one other zoom level. So it had only two at once. And it was really, really simple to implement, really easy. Uh, but if you're zooming through a lot of zoom levels and panning at the same time, it doesn't really work. It starts to get flickery and like, it, it's not usable. So uh, we had to rewrite animation basically from scratch. Uh, and fractional zoom, of course, it's uh, such a drastic change that I had to write half of leaflet code, which is quite a lot. Like it sounds pretty simple, but on the inside, it's very, very hard. So this is my experience doing code refactoring in <laughs> uh, Yeah. It turned out to be a much, much harder problem. And there's another thing. 
So leaflets was, uh, zoom animation was always implemented using CSS transitions because I always assumed that CSS transitions are like, they should be really, really optimized by browser implementation so they are always super fast and smooth and uh, they, they are really, really fast and that's why leaflet zoom animations are working very, very, very smoothly, much better than in other libraries. They are very fast, but they are impossible to control precisely. So when you start to implement more difficult features like uh, animating uh, along uh, an arbitrary curve, uh, you just can't use them. You, you need to ha uh, have a different approach to this. And CSS transitions are also pretty buggy, like up to even today in modern browsers. Uh, so there's also another approach, frame by frame animations. When you calculate the state, the map should be in, and all elements should be in, like on every frame. And this way you have full control over the animations, but it's much, much slower. Uh, so I had a choice, either like choose one animation uh, system, uh, like uh, ditch CSS transitions and use uh, arbitrary uh, like manual animations and this would significantly degrade leaflet performance as it exists today and as people are used to it. Or introduce confusing limitations, fragility and complexity by having two animation systems working at once or in different situations which complicates the code a lot. And also sometimes browsers break. So just recently, it's also one episode of many. Uh, Firefox released a new version, version 35, and suddenly all leaflet maps like, get really, really buggy and broken. And it was a huge, huge surprise and not a very pleasant one. So suddenly you, you wake up, uh, people have their browsers automatically updated and suddenly uh, they can't use their maps in a way they used to. So we got a huge alarm. We wrote to lots of Firefox developers. We like, wrote angry com comments, uh, submitted uh, issues and things like this. So, and it, uh, Firefox team did really well. They reacted almost instantly and they released a fix in like a week uh, that you can see it in the re release notes uh, that fixed the issue. Like, sorry guys, didn't test really well. And things like this happen really often. Well, not really often, but when it happens, it's a disaster. Uh, it happens, uh, something similar happened in Chrome too. Sometimes it happens like in other browsers too. So it's a problem developers have to deal with if they're using uh, modern uh, browser features actively. And I also didn't mention Android because Android is just development hell. You have thousands of different devices, uh, lots of different browsers, and on different devices, the same operating system version, the same browser like has different bugs it's pretty much impossible to debug. It's super, super difficult. Uh, and sometimes you just give up. You just can't handle it because it's so hard. Uh, so uh, this is, yeah, this is my experience tweaking leaflet animations and basically doing any kind of serious leaflet fixing work. And this is also what happens often when someone sends me a pull request and like on, on the surface, it's uh, like good pull, pull request doing some awesome improvement, but then it turns out that it breaks lots of things. So, and Leaflet is quite a popular uh, library and people send pull requests all the time doing improvements. So that's kind of situation maintainers have to deal with. And Sometimes you have angry reports about something being broken, and of course that's part of life. 
So open source maintainers of really popular uh, projects are often faced with very tough problems with, with hard choices, with uncertainty, with constant stream of issues and support requests, and like lots of intimidating work uh, that you have to do. And that leads to feeling anxiety and guilt and pressure. And, like, and this is called burnout. And this is a very, very common problem among open source uh, maintainers. You can make a Google search for it. Uh, there was even a talk about it on last year's Phosphagy in Portland. An excellent talk, there's a video of it. So that's a, that's a hard problem. So uh, eventually uh, I, I dealt with it <laughs> like this. So. Uh, it's a trap. So uh, I had so many problems to deal with, and uh, I had to deal with it uh, mostly like by myself. Uh, that uh, like at some point I just uh, the burnout happened, and I had to retreat to doing some other things, and. Like the happy place that <laughs> I'm talking about here is um, small, uh, really specific projects that do only one thing, but do it really well. And uh, like problems that uh, have really, really specific uh, boundaries that are really easy to test, to check, uh, to benchmark, and without uh, a huge number of people who request features and so on. So uh, this is one of the projects I created. It's really, really uh, uh, small compared to Leaflet, and it does only one thing, uh, spatial indexing of rectangles in memory in JavaScript. And it's the fastest uh, library of this kind in JavaScript. I really made sure it's super, super fast. I read lots of research papers, uh, applied uh, like algorithmical advancements of past years to create a simple but very, very efficient library that's now used in many places. And uh, like the fun thing about this, it's very useful in some applications. Uh, it can make performance much, much better. Uh, when you're dealing with lots and lots of objects and you need to index them and search them. Uh, and Airbrush is now used in OpenLayers 3. <laughs> it's an important part of OpenLayers 3, but it's not used in Leaflet because uh, I don't want to deal with the complexity. Like, Leaflet should stay simple. Uh, so I have all these small self-contained projects I created or contributed significantly to. Uh, yeah, there is also a project called Bullshit.js. We should, you should check it out. <laughs> um, I'll talk about some of the projects later. Uh, and also, when you're dealing with uh, working on a really, really complex project, uh, you have to like focus, concentrate a lot, and it's really hard to concentrate. Like your concentration skills drop when there is war in your country where you live. Uh, and another one, maybe not as uh, depressive one, much, much, much nicer, is that last year, ex approximately at the time where when I developed Leaflet 1.0 and like met all the all the hard problems, I became a father of twin girls. Uh, which also contributes, which also contributes to my concentration skills. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, those are my my daughters. They're perhaps the most beautiful people that appeared on Earth. So, um, right. So, uh, I, I dealt with many problems, and I had to, uh, at some point. Uh, pretty much abandoned development, and then I returned to it, and uh, eventually dealt with most of the issues. Uh, and uh, 
although uh, like a year have passed, a lot a lot of things ha have been changed in Leaflet. Like since the latest table, this is comparison of the stable branch and the master branch where 1.0 development is happening. Uh, so there are 170 files changed uh, and like 6,000 lines of code changed. That's a lot and almost 1,000 commits. Still a lot, even with all the problems. So uh, I can't really share like my excitement <laughs> about doing refactoring and like most of the work is was just rewriting the code, although it like works pretty much the same, but in a m more cleaner, more elegant way, in a way that you can understand understand easier to like implement some feature that you want. That's why I'm gonna talk about new features of Leaflet 1.0 that are there. So in the animations and usability department. There are flyover animations I talked about and showed before. Uh, much better tile loading that I also talked about. It's smoother, less flickering, more reliable. Much better panning inertia. It's just more natural when you pan around with mobile devices and mouse. Uh, smoother zoom on iOS Safari. It's uh, optimized better. Uh, Pop-up fade, fade out animation, which is kind of a small thing, but it matters. And small things matter. So there are accessibility improvements. So leaflets became a bit easier to work with when you're a blind person or if you just use a keyboard. Um, also, uh, I rewrote pretty much the whole code of uh, that uh, draws vector data in leaflets from scratch. And it's much, much, much better now. So now there is a flexibility that you didn't have before. You can use both SVG and Canvas renders on the same map. You can interleave them. You can have it on different panes and interleave them with tile layers. It's much more powerful. Uh, you can put vectors in custom panes. Uh, there is a huge performance boost. Uh, adding vector layers is like three times faster. It takes two and a half less memory, which is a lot. Uh, there's also a canvas layer, and it also got a huge performance boost uh, due to some techniques like partial draws, faster mouse events with some kind of ind indexing. Uh, it's really, really fast much faster than it was before. It's also Retina enabled, so it looks much better. Um, I also, there were lots and lots of problems with multiple gun, multiple line uh, layers in Leaflet that got solved by uh, doing them in a completely different approach. So they are no longer just uh, a collections of small polygons or small polylines. They are physically multi-polygons and multi-polylines in one SVG path element and or like canvas sequence of drawing commands. So it's like sounds complicated, but it's much better. Uh, Tileware got a huge lift, uh, and Tileware is a big part of Leaflet. Everything that deals with tiled images. So it's split into grid layer and tile layer. Previously, tile layer was a, this huge, huge piece of code that was pretty confusing, and it was har really hard to extend and do something your own with it. Now it's split into two, where tile layer is the small part, and most of the lifting, heavy lifting happens in grid layer, so that plugin developers and uh, Application developers can extend gridware to do any kind of like grid tiles that are not images, like drawing something with canvas, doing like fractals or rendering some vector data. And one good example of grid layer being put into work is that Tangram by Mapzen that does like WebGL rendering. It's, it's actually a Leaflet plugin. It is done on top of Leaflet. And uh, it's used uh, the, the new grid, grid layer functionality to, to make it possible. So there was previously tileware canvas. It's no longer. 
it's, you can use grid layer for the same, in the same simple way. Uh, projection support was also pretty much written from scratch with the help by guys who made uh, Broach for, for Leaflet plugin that integrates Broach for GGS and Leaflet to make it possible to use any kinds of weird projections in Leaflet. Uh, so previously there were lots of hard-coded projection hacks all over the code and uh, now they're all centralized and like no hacks, uh, it's, it's, it much, makes much more sense now. And it's easier to work with, easier to come up with your own projections, easier to use like simple non-geographic projections, the ones you would use in games or creating a map of a panoramic image like of huge resolution. Uh, yeah. and. This plugin, uh, due to the improvements uh, that, uh, that were made in Leaflet, brush for Leaflet, got rid of a huge chunk of code uh, that was previously trying to hack around the hacks present in Leaflet core. Um, there are also improvements in how layers are organized. All layers now inherit from layer class. And for most plugins, that's uh, like, the single break and change that they will have to do just inher inherit from layer instead of class. And like mostly Leaflet's API will be compatible with previous. There, w there are some break and changes, but mostly plugin developers won't have to deal with a lot of changes on the surface. So it's got more consistent, there's less code for Layers now because some functionality is shared, and it's good for plugins, easier to extend. There's custom page pane management, so you can put all your layers on different panes and interleave them. Like previously, trying to put a tile layer and then vector layer and then a tile layer on top was a really hard problem. Now it's not a hard problem anymore. There's also image overlay events that were just absent before. And there are some other performance improvements, like much faster layer construction. Now all the events that happen in Leaflet are delegated, so uh, internally it doesn't add listeners to each DOM element that is added, like markers. So they work just much faster. Uh, huge feature group performance boost. Like e every time you deal with groups of layers, they work faster due to much better event propagation me mechanism. There is much better memory footprint for DOM and Leaflet events. Like the implementation was optimized very hard. Uh, Let LNG construction is eight times faster, and so you have to deal with, with this when you're, for example, creating uh, when you have like a couple th hundreds of thousands of points and you d need to convert them to something that's consumable by leaflet uh, on the browser, and that's much faster now. Uh, removing events is two times faster. Uh, generally, leaflet 1.0 got more stable, has less freezes on like weird mobile devices and less race conditions. I know that some of the big companies uh, are starting to use Leaflet 1.0 that's not released yet and that's not stable. They start to use it in production because uh, it fixes some of the glaring issues they had previously and, and works better. And there are many other bug fixes and improvements. And Best of all, like uh, there was a lot of a lot of stuff added to Leaflet, and for some really weird magical reason, it got smaller. Well, not by a large margin, just a bit, but it's just a good illustration of the fact that it didn't get much more complex. There is no bloat coming with all the changes, so we managed to make it to to keep it under control. And 
many people will, will ask, like, when are you going to actually release one to know? Um, so here's uh, 1.0 beta 1 milestone. Uh, I want to release uh, a beta version first so that plugin developers can ca catch up and like fix all the compatibility issues. Uh, and in that milestone, there are seven issues open. So uh, the first beta will probably happen pretty soon. Yeah, seven issues open. But like sometimes it's it <laughs> sometimes you feel that like you're almost there. You're you can like you you give uh, promises. I'm gonna release it like in two days. Like maybe a month ago, I told people that I would release it uh, on today on on the phosphor G and announce 1.0, but <laughs> didn't happen. But because like there are always issues that are unexpected that you have to deal with. So maybe someone like to summarize, uh, someone would ask, "Oh, if it's awesome, but uh, it would get much more awesome if you could add rotation. So when are you going to add rotation?" <laughs> mm. After all my experience dealing with really, really complex uh, refactorings and like, things of the past year, I have to say that never again. I don't want to deal with compl complexity in Leaflet anymore. I want to keep it really, really simple and basic. And so that was, that's, that's part of my recovery plan. Like, recovery from burnout is learning to say no to many people. And sometimes uh, people are offended. Sometimes you have to uh, close their bug reports without much explanation. Sometimes, well, many times you have to reject their pull requests and people, like, they try hard to improve a project and they send their uh, improvement, like not asking anything for it, and suddenly they are rejected. That's a uh, like painful thing to, to deal with as a open source maintainer because you're, you're offending people. They tried hard and you're rejecting them. But you have to deal with, with this like, because that's, that's the part of open source maintainer's life. Otherwise, you will get crazy. Or Leafwood will turn into another bloated piece of software that's not going anywhere. So um, now I want to talk about Mapbox GL. Um, Mapbox GL, I think that Mapbox GL is the next big thing in maps. It's a really, really amazing technology, really absolutely stunning. And uh, I was happy to spend a lot of time working on Mapbox GL. And Mapbox GL, uh, it has lots of contributors, but uh, I, I had something like half a thousand commits to it uh, last year. So I put a lot of work into it too. And that's kind of weird because I'm uh, the maintainer of Leaflet and I'm also actively working on something that people may perceive as a like competitive library, something that you would use in place of Leaflet. And that's why people start asking me questions like, is Leaflet going away? Is it, will it become like dead eventually? And Mapbox, will it superset it completely? So first I'm going to show you a bit of Mapbox GL. Uh, if anyone doesn't know, it's uh, vector data rendered on the client in a beautiful, beautiful map that seamlessly zooms in. There is no notion of uh, zoom levels uh, that are like integer zoom levels. You, you zoom in smoothly and features appear smoothly and there are smooth, uh, the, the map smoothly flows from one state to another. And all, all of this can be dynamically controlled on the client side, so you can suddenly 
change colors, remo remove some features, you can reorder them, and that's all happens on the client side. <coughs> We're also working on a like, 3D perspective, which will, you will see soon. And uh, of course, eventually there will be 3D buildings and a bit of a harder problem, but eventually there will be uh, 3D terrain. And it will always will be combined with beautiful cartography that you usually only expect to see on rendered images because it's, a, it's very hard to do it dynamically and especially hard to do it on the browser side. Uh, and there are features that are just mind-blowing, like overlaying a video on top of an interactive map. So this is a video of some like, fire. It's just an interactive map. You can drag it. You can zoom it around. It's mind-blowing. Like, I've never, ever seen that before. And now it's possible. You can make like, new types of interactions with it that you've never seen before, too. Like really smooth transitions, like really, really awesome. And you can style it in a really, really flexible way. It's, the styling language is really powerful. It works on the client side, and we put a lot, a lot of thought into the styling language. It's not Carter CSS that you used to. Uh, like that you use in Mapbox Studio for traditional image map maps because uh, the styling is conceptually very different. And uh, we had to come up with a new styling language to be able to create fast vector rendering on the client and I'll also ditch the concept of uh, round zoom levels and make smooth transi transitions. Um, so, it will enable new kinds of interactive applications. Uh, kinds that you wouldn't have were possible before. Um, but, like, if it's so amazing, like, why wouldn't you just use it everywhere? And now I'm going to talk about Mapbox GL complexity because it's, a re it's, it's amazing, it's powerful, but it's really, really, really complicated. And it's really, really, really hard to work on. So to give you an example, uh, the most basic, basic thing you can think of for when doing maps is just drawing a line, right? What could be simpler? And uh, for example, in uh, Canvas API, in HTML, you just uh, write like, draw a line from this point to this point. It draws a line, and like, everything works perfectly. But if you're using WebGL, it's a really different matter. Because WebGL is a very low-level API, and it doesn't really understand what is lines like, and how they should be drawn. Uh, all, uh, well, because WebGL is basically uh, an API to graphic uh, uh, processors, hardware. And uh, GPUs, graphic processor units, they usually only care about triangles. That's all they know. They know how to draw triangles really, really well, but they can't do much else. So that's your task to come up with a way to turn everything that you want to draw with WebGL into triangles. <laughs> And that's where complexity appears. So there are some like, internal ways to, to draw simple lines with WebGL, but they look really crappy. Um, because when you're drawing a line, uh, you want to have it in different widths. You want to have anti-aliasing, so the edges look nice. And that's why. Um, to draw a line WebGL, you actually need to turn each segment into triangles. So here's an example of a segment of a line that's drawn with six triangles. So it can get really, really complex. So two triangles in the middle are drawn with a, with a 
a pack fill, and there's a bit of a blur on triangles on the, on the sides. So even a simple thing like line is, is complex. So, and you have to deal with line joins because like, there are different types of line joins. And if you have a round line join, for example, you have to come up with an algorithm to like, calculate angles between lines and like, fill, draw this round edge with triangles. Like, complexity appears out of nowhere. Uh, so drawing a, a line in WebGL is a really hard problem, as it turns out. So now, drawing a polygon in WebGL, yeah, you guessed it right, it's a really hard problem, <laughs> much harder. So one of my like, happy place projects that I spent many, many hours on is a new triangulation library. Triangulation is basically turning a polygon outline, like maybe with holes, maybe really, really complex, maybe with some bad data issues like self-intersecting polygons, collinear points, duplicate points. So turning polygons like this into triangles. That's basically all it does. But it's a really, really hard problem. And uh, many researchers wrote like tens and hundreds of academic papers on the issue and the papers are really really complicated and uh, before coming up with ERCOT I had to uh, implement and work on three different algorithms before Bef before I came to the fourth algorithm that actually clicked and started working as I want so it's pretty robust it can handle bad data uh, and it's absolutely freaking fast. And we wanted to do this kind of triangulation really, really fast because it happens on the browser. We need to make it like really, really fast. Like when the tile loads uh, in, in Mapbox GL, we need to triangulate every polygon. So yeah, check, check, check this out. This is a really great Library is very self-contained, it's small, and, uh, but it solves a hard problem. And it does it in the most optimized, fast way possible. And it's faster than alternative libraries by like sometimes by a margin of 10 or 20 times faster. So drawing polygon in WebGL is a very hard problem. Drawing text in WebGL, oh my god. I won't delve into uh, like the specifics of it, but I can say that on the initial stages of Mapbox GL development, the text drawing, uh, it took like half of the development time. It's just incredibly complex because like in WebGL you don't have the concept of, like you, you just can't say, draw me a text. You need to turn text and all the fonts you use either into triangles or into uh, textures or like, images and draw it in real time. So what Mapbox GL does under the hood, it turns uh, font stacks and uh, like all the letters you use in a particular tile into uh, a sprite. And not just a simple sprite, but uh, the so-called sign distance fields. Uh, that, that's the type of texture you can then use to draw text in a way that you can scale. You can rotate, you can like, make it bigger or smaller, and it would look nice in every way, like with nice anti-aliased uh, edges, and et cetera. But like, that's not the scope of this talk. Uh, there are, I, I think our, our guy, uh, Mabox, uh, Constantine gave entire talks about drawing text with WebGL. So, right, really hard problem. Now, placing labels in Mapbox GL. So you have a map, and you need, want to draw labels, and you want them to draw along the lines, you want to, like, have labels on all the POIs, and you want them not to collide with each other, and you don't want them to pop in and out all the time. You want them to smoothly stay in place when you're doing zooming so that 
your experience is nice. And you want them to like flip when you rotate the map. And like it's it's a very, very hard problem. So here's a video of a uh, debugging tool for placing labels. You can see uh, boxes around labels. And uh, some of the labels along the line are interpolated with boxes. And we use, like, we cover all the labels with boxes. And we put those boxes in a spatial index uh, using Arbosh, my library that I wrote for spatial index. Um, and then it figures out all the, all the collisions and, like, when labels have to appear or fade out. And uh, it deals with things like rotation and zooming. And you can see it's really, really hard to do. So just yesterday, uh, one of the core developers of Mapbox GL, the web GL guru of Mapbox, Ansys, uh, wrote a, he submitted a pull request uh, of something that he had been working for a lot of time uh, recently. Uh, it makes label placement uh, better. It's now faster, it's now denser, but it's just a small part of Mapbox GL label placement. It makes it better. You can see on the screenshots it's comparison, like it was more sparse and become, became less, uh, more dense. And if you look closely, there are 50 files changed and Almost 2,000 lines of code change for better label placement. <laughs> oh my god. It's crazy. <laughs> Next problem, displaying GeoJSON data in Mapbox GL. So Mapbox GL handles uh, data really differently. Uh, it's, uh, for all data that it can render needs to be tiled. It needs to be cut into tiles. And if you load GeoJSON dynamically into a map, you need to slice it into tiles. And it's not a simple problem, because it needs to be really fast. And here's an example of how it works now. So wait for it. It's loading the GeoJSON for this example. OK, so this is a sample file that's waiting 100 megabytes worth of GeoJSON. Uh, yeah, and it, like, it takes a couple seconds to load. But other, uh, after that, you can browse all this data seamlessly. And not only browse, but style it along with the map. You can like, put labels on top and like, put it into the right order and make it like transition width or color with while changing zoom. So it's pretty awesome. And like how does this happen? So as a part of my like really specific algorithmic mathematical problems that I decided to solve, it's GeoJSON tiling. So I wrote a library called GeoJSON VT. Here's an example of 20 megabyte file loaded into, into it. And you can see that you, you load it, and it slices the GeoJSON into tiles. And it slices it in, not, not everything into tiles, not up to the last zoom level, but enough so that all subsequent uh, requests of tiles are happening instantly. So it slices up to, up to for example, fourth zoom level, and then if you zoom zoom, drill down more, it slices more dynamically. So all subsequent browsing of the GeoJSON is really, really fast. Um, so yeah, it's a really awesome library, and it enables new kinds of things you can do with GeoJSON, because you can like display a much larger amount of GeoJSON than you could before. And uh, in theory, this can be used in Leaflet too. I just need to write a plugin for it. Like you, the same kind of 100 megabyte GeoJSON that you saw in WebGL, you can see in Leaflet, in theory, uh, because it does simplification of features on each zoom level. So 
on the low zoom level, it like throws out small features, it simplifies uh, the curves so that they are not as detailed and things like this. So it's a pretty sophisticated approach to tiling. And so this library recently some people at Mapbox uh, started using on the server side to, for slicing GeoJSON tiles really, really fast without uh, going through the whole heavyweight stack of Mapnik and C++ and different libraries, Python, things like that. Just pure Node.js library. So, but there is a problem when I try to, when I, I get ex inspired by Mapbox GL and all the awesome things it can do, but in Leaflet, many of the stuff is just like, it doesn't make sense to, to even start to implement. Because uh, those libraries have very different purposes. So many people ask me this, like, hey, Vlad, wouldn't it be awesome to make a WebGL renderer in Leaflet, in Leaflet core? And so I have the, <laughs> the same answer. So Leaflet. Leaflet is here to stay, obviously. It's meant to be simple, like really simple, really easy to work with, really easy to write plugins for, really easy to uh, give it to some random guy and he would learn to do web mapping in a in couple hours. So Leaflet will remain the go-to mapping library because it's that simple, it's easy to use, it works on all platforms. It has tons of plugins, like 200 plugins. It's amazing. It has a huge community. Everyone knows it. You can see it everywhere. So it's here to stay. It's not going away. I won't abandon Leaflet's development, obviously. And there's Mapbox GL, which is like the new, super innovative approach to maps. Uh, it's mean to be very, very complex. And also push the boundaries of what's possible. It won't be used everywhere. It will, it will be used in pretty specific uh, uh, cases where you need so, like, amazing new types of interactivity for maps. But for all the rest, there's leaflet. So there are opposite sides of spectrum. On one side you have leaflet, which is super simple, and other side you have Mapbox GL, which is very complex and much more powerful. And the world needs both. So I am very excited to be pushing both libraries, working on both. And that's why everything will be awesome. So thank you. That's my whole presentation. Uh, there are five minutes left. I don't know if there's a need to ask, uh, to answer questions, but yeah, I think I can answer some. Uh, can you go over the difference between OpenLayers 3 uh, wasn't designed to render vector data as a map, as a styled map. So it's uh, uh, like uh, in terms of features, it's closer to the old-fashioned uh, web mapping libraries. While Mapbox GL is is specifically tailored to rendering uh, maps on clients. So. Yeah, but it's a pretty awesome library too, and so I admire things that OpenWares guys are doing. But it's also pretty complex. Like even, they were wrote it from scratch, but it's still really complex, and they are still trying to implement every feature that a person could possibly think of. So it's harder to work with than live with. Any other questions? Right. Uh, Mapbox JS is just a leaflet plugin that makes that makes it easier to work with uh, uh, Mapbox services in leaflet, and that's all it does. It's basically a leaflet, right? Yeah. 
in, in where? Right. So it's from YouTube to that, it's going to be more of that Well, there are plugins that uh, convert KML into GeoJSON. Uh, and uh, supporting uh, KML as a first class citizen in mapping libraries doesn't make much sense because KML is a horrible format. It's really, really bad. It's hard to work with, it's complex, it's verbose, and GeoJSON is better in every way. So whenever you have a, a format, a weird format that you have to work with, you just convert it to GeoJSON and you use so like something like GDAL for that. Or like There are lots of tools to convert to GeoJSON. And GeoJSON is the best format for, for map data on the web. So convert everything to GeoJSON when you can. <laughs> Right. Can you talk about um, label placement in WebGL, like uh, cross tile boundaries? So are labels pre-computed? Uh, yeah, so that's also a pretty hard problem. I think that's, uh, there are some, there are some codes about this in Mapbox.gl uh, uh, that handles this in a way, in some way, but uh, I can talk specifics because uh, that was not me who implemented this, but it's, it's handled some way, but it was handled by a different person. And because it's a very hard problem, it's, uh, it's hard to figure out what's going on. <laughs> okay? I would expect so. Yeah, so I think it's eventually it will you will be able to use it uh, in the same way, like with the same type of features, but uh, maybe a bit harder, harder because it's conceptually different. So simple things like putting a marker on the web is, doesn't mean the same thing because you need to put a marker as a part of the data that is styled and that is styled in a way and interleaved with other layers. So you, you will have to think a bit differently about how you do web mapping. But I, I'm expecting like most of the f features to, that you do in Leaflet to be implemented in Mapbox.gl because it's like not technically a problem. So we're looking forward to see what people will come up with once Mapbox GL becomes major. Are you going to do that separately or are you going to leave it together? Leaflet and Mapbox GL? Yeah. So there's, uh, I, I wrote a Mapbox GL leaflet plugin as a proof of concept where you have a leaflet map and you have a Mapbox GL uh, map underneath and it works together. But uh, like it's very fun to, to see, but it, it doesn't uh, make as much sense as you would think of because uh, like putting Mapbox GL into Leaflet limits what you can do with uh, Mapbox GL because like things like you can no longer do rotations, for example, and uh, yeah, things like this. So it's uh, it limits the possibilities of what you can do uh, with Mapbox GL. So while it's nice uh, to, to, for example, like you have a leaflet map and you quickly want to hack Mapbox GL into it and so like slowly transition to Mapbox GL maybe for some kind of application, then it can be useful. But otherwise I would expect, you, like it would be better if you started from scratch developing, like thinking in the terms that Mapbox GL is built in if you want to use Mapbox GL. And if you want something simple or you just use, use Leaflet without the WebGL stuff and complexity. Okay, I think, yeah, 10, 10 a.m. I think we're done. <laughs>